Good afternoon. Um, this is our last afternoon, so um, we're going to be seeing how to tie things together and, and um, before we take leave of each other. Before we get started, I want to introduce uh, two people that have you, I want you to know who they are in case, as you write to Trauma Healing Institute, you, uh, you might have an answer or a message from these people. So, Margie, yes. just say what it is you do in Trauma Healing. Hi. Uh, many of you know me as the specialist for children and teens trauma healing, and that is true. I continue to function in that uh, capacity, and it's my pleasure to do that. Um, also, I am helping Harriet on the program model and materials team, which means that when new materials are to be produced, um, that I am helping with the editing and uh, review of those materials. Thank you. Thank you. So that's what this person looks like. And um, now I'm asking Lara Gish. Uh, I want you to know that the, many of our organizations take the prayer very seriously. And we have told you that if you put an event, a trauma healing event on our calendar, there are many benefits. People will know about it. And you might be surprised who wants to go to a country you would never have imagined and take part in a trauma healing session. You can post your things as closed meaning you're not open to the public, but at least we know that something is going on. The other perk is we have Laura, and she's mobilizing prayer for everything that's on that calendar. So you want to say your name and a little about that? Yes, thank you. So my name is Laura Gish. I'm privileged to serve in prayer mobilization. It's an honor to recruit partners praying for this work. Um, it's so close to the heart of God. And there are thousands of people praying for this, for this meeting, and for you all. And it's an honor to do so. So as Harriet said, thank you for sending us ways that we can be praying for you and mobilizing people to pray strategically for this work. Thank you so Thanks. much, Laura. Yeah. As, as we know, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. So. Not only your calendar events will we will be praying for and mobilizing prayer for, but also um, other needs that you might have. And I'm telling you, Laura and her team, Nena, are on it. <laughs> I rely on them a lot. So um, this song, I don't know. Uh, there's a song called There is a Balm in Gilead that has been tickling my mind for the last few days. I even told Mary Beth uh, yesterday that maybe we, sh maybe we need to sing this. And then last night, uh, during the, question, the panel, after the documentary, the Unchained documentary, the question was, what do we do for next steps? And these ideas came together in my mind. If some of you we're here last year when we had Kathleen O'Connor speaking on um, Genesis through the lens of trauma. I recommended some of her books, and some of you have, are very familiar with it. I'm looking um, at the book Jeremiah, Pain and Promise, because this expression, there is a balm in Gilead, or is there not a balm in Gilead, is from one of Jeremiah's laments. Um, she entitles the chapter 6 on the laments of Jeremiah saying, if only tears were possible. Because sometimes, as we heard this morning or this week, when we are traumatized, we can't even get the tears to come out. As Diane was saying, sometimes that takes a lot of work that we are even able to feel that pain. and. Um, and uh, express it. I'm just going to read you a couple quotes from this book. On page 60, she says, Grieving is not an activity for the faint-hearted, but a fearsome enterprise that may take generations to complete. Yet to look into the heart of overwhelming loss and to mourn them are the very things psychic numbing inhibits. 
The weeping poems of Jeremiah work to bring on sorrow and loss as if the poems themselves were mourning women come to awaken the grief of the bereaved. So the laments can help us to mourn, to grieve the situation and what are, we're going to be grieving right now and lamenting is the abuse of power whether that be in the U.S. or in, your other, in other countries or globally, whatever your context. In traditional societies, mourning rites can give structure to sorrow and become a poultress for sores. Perhaps they are the balm of Gilead that is supposed to heal the nation. So Gilead was a, a city in Israel that was renowned for traditional medicine. And there were, you know, a balm, something that you put on a sore to bring healing, to draw out the infection, to draw out the bacteria and bring healing. Kathleen also talks about the Israeli, uh, the Jewish ways, uh, the Israelites' way of mourning involving rituals such as full body things such as rolling in the dirt wearing certain clothes putting ashes and sackcloth on you throwing dust in the air and that these kinds of practices cause pain and discomfort for mourners uh, and this releases grief over a much larger life disturbances. So these rituals that they had were actually helpful things to help us grieve when we're stuck, when we don't know what to do. And I guess I identify this with this because I see a lot of abuse of power in my country, in other places, and I don't know how to respond. And that was the question last night. What do we do? We, we feel it, but what do we do? And what Kathleen is saying here is the grieving might be the very first step to get in touch with that pain. Just let that, it's not a program that we're gonna do, it's not an activity. It is to grieve, to feel the pain. In uh, Jeremiah 6, uh, it is written, O daughter of my people, gird on sackcloth, roll in ashes, make mourning as for an only child, most bitter wailing. And then she says, the loss of a child, of an only child, or of any child, is a grief beyond bearing, so intimate, a devastation, that it hardly can be taken in for its shock and loss. So God is telling Israel to grieve that much for the situation in their country. And as you know, this is, you guys know the Bible, this is um, because of the way they were behaving and then it comes to the very interesting part to me. And what Kathleen and other scholars, although not all scholars, are proposing is that um, God himself is grieving for his people and for his country. That God is not like the other gods of the Middle East who are not feeling anything, <laughs> but his heart is breaking even as our hearts are breaking for situations. And so I've asked the uh, team here um, to read parts of Genesis 8, 819 through 93. They're going to be reading it a bit as a, a drama. I've asked Brian to play the role of God, which he was very happy to do for even a split, a short moment in time. No Indian, no Indian accent this time. So um, I think we can read it. My sorrow is beyond healing. My heart is faint within me. Behold, listen, the cry of the daughter of my people from a distant land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not within her? Why have they provoked me with their graven images, with foreign idols? Harvest is past, summer is ended, and we are not saved. But the brokenness of the daughter of my people, I am broken. I mourn. Dismay has taken hold of me. 
Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has not the health of the daughter of my people been restored? Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had a place in the desert, a wayfarer's lodging place, that I might leave my people and go from them. For all of them are adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like their bow. Lies and not truth prevail in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me. And so like in many of our countries, as, as Baraka was saying this morning, there was a lot of Christians in the U.S. There's a lot of Christians in Israel. There were a lot of Christian or God-fearers. But it was a toxic variety of, Christianity, of, of faith in God. And um, God himself is lamenting. Toxic Christian religiosity does not bring healing. And it is God himself saying, is there not a balm in Gilead? What has happened to my presence? What has happened to my presence in this country? And uh, you're familiar with the words. You know, people are saying peace, peace. When there is no peace, people are lying. People are sleeping like horses with their neighbor's wife, neighing after them. The pictures in these prophets are so graphic. Um, and God himself is grieving. God himself is grieving for what is happening. It's a lovely gift we have as followers of Jesus, as God's children, to be able to um, proclaim the gift that he gives in connection with him that soothing balm that he can offer. Um, but the heart cry of the people is not only relevant to us, but the heart cry of God is also very relevant. So I'd like you to listen to a recording by Mahalia Jackson. This song, There is a Balm in Gilead, was written in, they trace it back to 1800s. They can find it actually recorded in the 1800s. But Mahalia Jackson's newer version of it was done around the time of Martin Luther King's um, movement forward. So I'd like you to just listen and reflect on the words and on her singing from her heart about this pain. For the pain of your heart, not only for the children of Israel, but also, Lord, for the pain that we see and experience in and around us, and also, Lord, for our own pain and struggle. So we come before you now and just ask that you would speak to us, show us what's on your heart for us, and touch those sad or hurting areas of us where lament would be a healing gift that could flow from this pain. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I just invite you to spend a few minutes with the Lord right now and just pray about where is an area in your own life or experience or with those with whom you work that you would lament at this point, um, the, and pull from the grieving heart of God as you do that, all right? So I'll give you just a few minutes. Um, what I'd like to invite you to do is to um, choose an expressive form that you would like to use today 
We're going, to use, we're going to explore the same ones from yesterday, but you do not need to go to that same group. You choose what, what fits best for you for this lament experience and creation and also for um, your own personal preference. So <clears throat> up here near the piano will be an opportunity for you to use poetic, poetic and sound forms for expression. Okay, that's right up here. In the back corner back here is going to be visual arts. So you can explore back there if you like. And these will be collective. Okay, collective laments. And then we have a drama and movement, which will be back in this corner. And then up here will be the individual. So you have an opportunity to just spend your individual time in it. As Harriet mentioned before, the focus of this lament time is about abuse of power. So just you may have felt some other things that you explored in just reflecting on your own experience and your own uh, grief, but in this time we're going to collectively or individually think about how to express or represent the abuse of power. All right, I want, you, I want to invite you to come back together. All right, so first the poetic group is going to share with us. So I just ask you to give your attention up here to the front. Lord, do you see me? I feel alone. I'm afraid, confused, abandoned. I see the chains. Do you see me? The helicopters circle, will they shoot me? Was that my mother's car? Is she leaving me? I feel alone. I deserve the respect I receive neglect. Lord, see them. The children, the rejected ones. The immigrants. The elderly. The women. The wounded. Lord, Lord you, you are, are good. good. You, you know, know their, their pain. pain. So um, I have been a writer since before I could write. My first poem was at three years old. I told it to my mother from my high chair. Um, so that's how I carved space for myself in the world, is through writing. That's how I gave myself a voice. And uh, sometimes I can't shut up now. Um, but I just felt really convicted today to write a poem of lament for people that are voiceless. So the name of this poem is um, A Poem of Lament for Stolen Voices. And this is the poem. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. I spend a lot of my time gardening, and I live in Florida where it's the tropics. There's this one particular thing that is always on my mind, and it curls up. It's called a vine, and it keeps getting longer and longer, and pretty soon it overpowers whatever it can attach itself to, and it has even taken down healthy trees that maybe are 30 or 40 feet high and starts bending it to its shape. So when I'm out there with my machete, I can take down the vine, I can pull it off, it still grows back. And so that was our metaphor today. Go ahead. Also, you can see how. Oh, sorry, come get in front of me. You can see how all the good relationships and all the good uh, uh, qualities are being eaten up by the vine. You can barely see them in the background. So tell me some of the, the, the categories. Community, relationships, joy, love, 
Self-worth. Self-worth. Fellowship. And friendship. Mm -hmm. They're being, can be taken <clears throat> over by deception, abuse, racism, withholding of affection or support, cultural impact. So. Oh, yeah. All, right. All right, our dance movement group, would you please come up? Division in the nation. Immigration. Fear. Powerlessness. Racism. Generational poverty. Human Oppre trafficking. Oppression. Domestic effect. Sex trafficking. Feeling stuck. Abuse of power. Fear. Complicity. We can sort this out. <laughs> No, we can't. Oh, my God. Um, I only had a little bit of time, but so I did what I could in the time, you know, with kind of a jagged, ripped up community or country and the blood on each side. Um, I guess the part that surprised me in doing this is that I wanted to put some ground on the bottom and um, I just put one tiny little piece of green because I realize I'm concerned not only about the community but also about the environment that is, is getting ruined. I just read the uh, coral wreath off of Australia is yeah, it's going to be history pretty soon if we don't do something. And then you read in the news of decisions being made so that um, country, uh, companies can make more and more money, but um, the environment is also going. So it's not only for the injustice, the abuse of power that is causing more and more division. Um, we, we, I got called um, on the weekend or last week of um, uh, undocumented people in the country there's a catholic church in new haven with was it 800 latinos who are living in fear total fear because at any point they could be you know taken out of our country so it's the people it's the environment and the whole thing so i'm i'll work on it more but that's as far as The drawing is rough and faint, but the picture was strong for me. Um, I drew a, a ship and um, a heavenly city off to one side and the ship going off in search of the heavenly city with people on the ship reaching out, looking for that new place. And some among them who are reaching off the other side and pushing back and pushing off people in search of refuge. Thanks. I kind of came in late, so it's not complete, but I think the Lord is birthing something that I need to process through, and my thoughts are first concerning the conflict in Ukraine. Oh, Lord, like pawns in an invisible, diabolical game, lives are being broken, thrown about, used, and discarded, lost without guilt, broken without cause, murdered without choice, decimated. Will there be relief? Will there be sense? There are no answers that satisfy the innocence, men, women, children, babushkas, chocha, jeti, abandoned, fearful, and hopeless. There's more to go, but I haven't gotten there yet. All right, what I'd like you to do, I'd like you to go back into your creative, expressive groups right now and have a time of prayer together about what's been on your heart, all right, and what you've expressed. Um, you, you can debrief just a little if you want, but just spend time in prayer together and for each other, all right? I'll call you back together through a time of closure in just a minute. The individual groups, you can pray at your table together. Here is a bomb in Gilead.
sometimes I feel discouraged. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's pain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to like Peter, if you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. There is a bomb in So what do you do when they, you are witness of an abuse of power in your country, in your continent, in the world? It starts with lament, lamenting to God and lamenting with God. He too is wishing that tears would flow like a fountain, that that grief could start to come out. And I think if we can start there, we'll, we'll know what the next steps are. And I think we have a lot to learn from groups that have experienced suffering for 400 years. This is an African-American spiritual. There is a bomb in Gilead, and we can find it. I loved oh, Gus in the movie last night. You know, it's when he really lamented to God that he said the conversation started, the relationship started. So there's hope here, there's a way forward here when we can really feel that pain, not just pretend it doesn't exist. We know it's, I don't wanna watch it, I don't wanna know, let me just live in my little great world. But that doesn't make it go away and as a church, we need to be a place where we have our eyes open, our hearts broken. And we open up that space for God to bring us together to, to do the things, as, as Roy Peterson was saying this morning, um, it's, his grace will abound. He will help us. Uh, when we are weak, he is strong. It's bigger than we can do. We have no idea, but God will, God is, God's heart is broken more than our own. So uh, 
Let me pray, dear God. We just want to ask you to help us even in this, in this need to lament the evil that we see, the abuse of power that is present, that is um, hurting those who are marginalized, those who are vulnerable. We thank you that when we come to that place, like Gus did, we will find you there. As Diane has written, when you are, in the, when you are crushed in the darkness, you will find Jesus there, also crushed. So Lord, we ask that you help us not to be paralyzed, not to uh, segregate ourselves and pretend that the trouble is not there, that there are not people suffering, Lord. So give us a lot of courage because this is hard to take in. So Lord, we pray that your light would shine. We know that the darkness can never put out the light. So we ask, Lord, that you would rescue those who are being trafficked. We ask that you would, would, would help those who are being shoved off the boat as they flee their country. We ask, Lord, we lift up to you all of the people who are suffering from the abuse of power, those that we know about in our own countries. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to make be places of, of, that we could experience the life and abundant life that you give, that we would be places where people could find safety and your Holy Spirit. And we pray for the churches in our countries that you would help this to come to be. So we thank you for this time. Amen. Um, as we get seated to hear our closing um, remarks from our listeners, from the author's reflection, and from Diane, um, I've praised our advisory council, and I would like to remind the wonderful advisory council that we will be meeting at 4.30 in the boardroom, which is on this floor at the far end, the exact diagonal. So if you are advisory council, just a reminder about that. So I think we're ready. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Sherwood and Judy Lingen, Judith Lingenfelter to come and share some of the as they've listened, listening is a good thing, we know, um, just to share with us their reflections on what they have seen. Well, for us, it's been a special time. It's our first time to come to the uh, community uh, practice, and uh, we've enjoyed it. We have never really sat through uh, a trauma healing session, uh, and uh, we've read the book. So uh, we have some idea of what's going on, but it's been a fun time. So Judy, uh, what surprised you about this conference? Okay, well, I wouldn't, oh, I wouldn't say surprised because I know Harriet, uh, <clears throat> but I would say delighted would be the better choice. And what I would like to say, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to see what I'm talking about, Sherwood. So would everybody who's here from outside of the United States um, stand up? I know, I realize that. But I was so blessed with the fact that there is so much diversity here, uh, diversity of voices, uh, diversity of colors, diversity of dress, I just love it. Because to me, that's what a community of practice looks like. I do. Okay, Sherwood. Um, <laughs> What did you learn by your participation in the orientation session? All right, good. Well, I tell you, the orientation session was really helpful to me. Uh, first of all, I, I was stunned by the number of new people that were here and were looking and interested in what was happening in trauma healing and were considering this as something they might want to incorporate into their ministry. We had the room in the corner packed, people sitting on both sides, both rows around the table. It was really wonderful to see that. Uh, and then I got to know some of those people, and I was surprised at how different they were. Some were in charge of ministries, some were representing a ministry, some had just come to hear about it because someone had encouraged them to give money to it. And so in all of this, it was just really marvelous to see these people. 
And then uh, the facilitators uh, were just great. They took us through uh, some of the program, helped us begin to understand what trauma healing was about. Uh, we went through the, the arc. Uh, we didn't do the whole program, but we saw what the ARC was like, what it was for, and the critical steps in the trauma healing process. And so for me, that was a great education, and uh, it, it, what it did is it brought the book to life. I'd read the book before I came, but going through that session, it helped me to see this as a live practice. The teaching methods were exciting, and so I was impressed with that. Uh, now, Judy and I decided at Harriet's advice that we would go to different sessions. And so, Judy, what did you get out of the experience section? Well, my field is cross-cultural education, so I love the different teaching methods. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I felt at some times like I was sitting in the old literacy mo uh, uh, meetings from SIL. And the reason I say that is because we talked about a lot of these things. Uh, and I really appreciated that because I learned a tremendous amount, uh, was able to participate uh, in those. And so I felt as I listened to the experience of, okay, what, what worked, uh, what opportunities, what, what uh, challenges, what kinds of things were there, that they were things that uh, I could connect with even though I wasn't doing the kind of trauma healing that you are doing. So I very much appreciated just hearing the stories, getting some new ideas for ways to present things. And so for me, it was really wonderful. Okay, well, sure would. Um, <clears throat> hey, come back to the microphone. <laughs> oh, no, that's right. I got <laughs> yeah, they told me you can't get away from the microphone. Oh, gosh. All right. What was the most exciting thing you experienced in these last three days? Okay, I want to answer that question. What was exciting? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, Harriet Hill is an old friend of ours. We have been working with SIL since uh, well, 40 years ago we started, mm -hmm. 1997. Uh, and we've never been members, but we've been doing consulting work for them for this long, long period of time. And during that time period, Harriet and Judy and I have been partners in several conferences and workshops. And it was really a wonderful experience for us. She was sitting in our living room, I think it was 2010, uh, I'm not quite sure, uh, but uh, SIL had gathered at William Carey and that all the leaders were there, and Harriet was complaining that there was really no place for trauma healing in SIL's ministry, that the leaders weren't really buying into this, that this wasn't where they wanted to go, and she got a phone call from American Bible Society during that set of series of meetings inviting her to come to American Bible Society. And we said, Harriet, go. <laughs> now, we had no idea what God was going to do. Uh, and, you know, Harriet didn't know what God was going to do. But the most exciting thing for me is the community of practice. This did not exist then. There was no community of people like this that were gathered to think about doing this globally. The scope of the ministry was narrow. It was focused on some areas that had suffered significant trauma that SIL was working in. And so at this point today, this is incredible what God has done, the variety of people that God has brought together, and the wonderful people that, that have come to support this. I was so impressed with you, Diane, with you, Phil, uh, and with uh, Michael in terms of the consulting and support work that you're giving them and how you provide expertise that the church needs. And so this has been exciting to me, to see this incredible community of practice with people from all over the world, Bible societies represented from other places, other organizations involved. This has been a great thing to see and watch. So I want to celebrate God. God has done some incredible things uh, since Harriet got that phone call back about 2010. But Sherwood, you were going to oh, ask yeah, me Judy. one question. I do question. have one question for you. <laughs> <laughs> you we see? didn't rehearse this, Sherwood. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Judy, as you sat through this conference, what did, at what time did you say, oh, no, not again? <laughs> and I think you all know the answer to that, three-minute table conversations. Yeah. And that's because I was sitting with a wonderful group of people from African Enterprises. And I don't think we ever got a chance to finish any discussion. And I, they were wonderful. I learned all kinds of things from, from uh, John and John and, and uh, uh, thank you, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, but I never got to, to actually listen to the, to the full, even a full sentence. It was like, you know, okay, because I mean, it takes a little bit to, to get yourself organized. And I was listening to other tables and realizing 
how easy this is for, for the Americans. Well, number one, we've been doing this a long time, so we just sort of, you know, it's almost like popcorn. Oh, well, this and this and this, and then pretty soon they've got their answers, and I'm thinking, but I haven't even heard from them yet, let alone formulate an answer to this. So that troubled me. Uh, <clears throat> however, the other thing that I think you need, that I, I thought, well, maybe I could teach you. I want you all to stand up here. Uh, <clears throat> You gotta stay behind the mic. They can't hear you. Oh gosh, I can't this stand. I'll do it out here for you, okay? Yeah, I can't. Okay. I can't stand behind the mic. Okay. Yeah. One of the things that I realized is that uh, uh, you you tried this, but you didn't get very far. But I I had developed uh, some exercises because. All these conferences are such that you sit entirely too long, and you know this, and you tried to, to, uh, to have us stand up. But I developed a little thing that one could, uh, could uh, certainly improve upon, but we're going to do it anyway. Okay, up with Jesus. Okay, down with the devil. <laughs> Walk the straight and narrow. Come on. Okay. Fight against evil. Okay. Embrace God's wisdom. Okay, maintain balance. Okay, up with Jesus. Amen. All right. Okay, the last question she has for me. <laughs> I thought you'd answered it already. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Sherwood, as somebody who studied leadership, Oh gosh! <laughs> he did. As someone who has studied leadership, and uh, as ministry and body work, uh, what observations and reflections would you make from your participation in this conference? You know, <clears throat> the most important thing in what you're doing is equipping the church. The most important thing. Uh, and the most important thing that you're doing is working with the local church globally. These problems are so huge, and the enemy is so powerful, and the systems are so connected and brutal that this is not something anyone can handle alone. And it's about the body of Christ. It's about doing the work in the body. And so... What I see is the tremendous opportunity in trauma healing and the program you've developed is equipping the body of Christ to work together to heal their own people. And to me, that is a powerful thing. That if you can work and develop local people to do this with one another and to be a healing presence in their own communities, our churches in the United States are not that. And we're not doing that for our own people and we're not doing it for our communities. And so this is powerful. But even more exciting than that is that you have an organization here, American Bible Society, with a president who has a vision for doing this kind of healing work. The film last night was just a wonderful example of that, the power of this film that focuses on conversations toward reconciliation between races. This problem we hoped we'd made a lot of progress in the 60s. And what I learned last night about Philadelphia schools is that they are more segregated. They are just like the South was when I was a child living in Virginia, completely divided. And black schools and white schools, that's not the way we dreamed it. That's not what we should be. That wasn't Martin Luther King's dream. And, and so we have just defaulted back to our old habits culturally. And it's only the church that can help us to break that. But we have to do it in the church because they're the only people that are willing to listen to the cry that God has for all of his people. And so this is a tremendous opportunity. And I am blessed by this organization that has a vision to do that uh, and to use so many different tools. WhatsApp. Can you imagine that? Uh, the film and other kinds of media and then this wonderful training workshop to help people engage and become the people of God and the mission of God. Now, the one thing I've just studied in terms of leadership is this, that when leaders do not lead the body, they're not leading and nobody's following. The question I always have, is there anybody following? And if people aren't following, unless they are pushed, the leader's not leading. And so the critical thing is this, that Ephesians 4 describes the church 
as being built together by ligaments. And the question is, what are the ligaments? What is the ligaments that make the body, enable the body to do its work? It's all the gifted people that are there, uh, the leaders. The leader's job is not to lead, it's to be a ligament. It's to be able to work in the body, to get people working together to do the work of the kingdom of God. That's what I see as the real potential for this program. To equip people to be ligaments in the body of Christ, to do the work of the body, and to be the body, loving one another. Now I want to close with a piece of art. Uh, I see the artwork here. It's the artwork here. I love the Navajo art piece that Carol put on the board yesterday. And, and I was going to use it in my lecture, and I forgot. But, you know, this whole piece that we've got to take the risk. We've got to go down the dark alley to be, be able to help people. We can't walk by and just ignore it. We have to go in the dark alley. We have to be willing to take the risk. And in the body of Christ, we have to go there. But the thing of it is that we're not going to get quick results. The best illustration for, for me uh, is my ignorance in art. Okay. Years ago, uh, my daughter-in-law gave me two volumes on Van Gogh. And uh, so I took this one volume and I opened it and began to look through it. And I was stunned, page after page after page after page of sketches of peasants and farming and food and peasant cottages. And then I come to a page that has a photograph of a painting called The Potato Eaters. And when Van Gogh painted that painting, he said, that's it. That's what I've been dreaming of. That's what I've been thinking of. And he never painted a peasant after that. It was all done. Now, what was it? In his mind, he had a masterpiece. Uh, and he was struggling to get that down on the canvas. And he worked with one sketch after another sketch after another sketch after another sketch. And he didn't get it. And then he tried some oils. And he did this oil. And he did that oil. And he did another oil. And he still didn't get it. But then finally, when he got it, he knew this was what I've been dreaming of. This is what I was hoping for. I've created the masterpiece. Now, what I want to say to you is that trauma healing is that kind of work. It's one sketch after another sketch, one try after another try. It's coming back again and again with people and, and seeing what God does in each one. And you've gone through this and you've got days, but every day is a new sketch. And then at the end, what we've said is that it's not over yet, that it takes, it's a journey. It's a longer journey. And God is creating the masterpiece. We're his servants. And so we work in this sketch after sketch until God produces the masterpiece that God wants in that local church, that God wants in this person, that God wants in this local community. This is the work that we've been given to do. Jesus has this word for it. He says, I want you to love as I have loved you. And the only way we can do that is one sketch at a time. I've discovered that in my own life. It happens when somebody interrupts me. Am I going to get irritated or am I going to love them? Uh, it happens when somebody disappoints me. Am I going to be frustrated because I didn't get my own way or am I going to love them? And as we work in this sketch after sketch, it's really about being Christ for people in this wonderful opportunity. So I just want to thank you for letting us be a part with you, to think this through with you, to process it with you, and I want to encourage you, keep on sketching. Because the masterpiece is God's, and he's going to produce it if we do our work. So God be with you as you go. And a huge thanks to you, Sherwood and Judy, for uh, taking your time to be with us. I know you have some grandchildren not far from here, so, you know. <laughs> um, but we really, really appreciate your, your interest, your companionship through this week. Thank you. The next to the last item on the agenda is uh, the author's reflections. And if I could ask Dick and Margaret to come forward. This actually started um, in 2001. I had figured out the years, but I'm really weak on numbers. It's about 15 years or so. So I thought it would be nice to hear from the original I mean, the original authors who were there. And uh, I'll turn it over to Margaret and Dick. First. first. Okay. Um, 
it's very good to think about this, and I'm very sorry that there's nobody here from Congo, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, because as far as my beginning of this was concerned, it all came through church leaders in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We had evacuated three times, and in 2000, I was allowed to go back and, and visit with our church leaders. And I found that they weren't interested at that point very much in using the Bible. They weren't that interested in literacy. What they wanted to know was, why were people behaving in such peculiar ways? Why were people angry? Why were there more suicides than they'd ever known before? And even with my elementary knowledge of mental health, I knew that this was caused by the, the trauma of the war, of the things that they'd seen and the rapes and the killings that had gone on. So I went back to Nairobi, went to a meeting and found Dick, uh, obviously as a psychiatrist, and said to Dick, what are we going to do about this? And he can take the story on from there because also Harriet got involved and Pat uh, Miersma was involved in this. And we were looking for material that was translatable into many languages that would make sense and also was biblically based but with good mental health principles. And I remember Pat had half an office of books. And none of them worked. <laughs> <laughs> we looked at them all and we said, nah, that one you can't translate. That one's got no scripture in it and so on. So that was where it really all started. And then after a little while, people were saying, well, yes, this is fine for us. We're adults. What about the children? The children are traumatized as well. And at that point, I was involved in doing a children's trauma healing book, which didn't look like this then. It now looks very much better. It's got a very nice picture on it. And I would like to say that there are two other authors who aren't present here, which is Debbie Braxmer of the Reformed Church of America and also Lynn Westman of Mercy Ships because they were involved with me in the original children's book. Now, it's changed quite a bit, as I'm sure Margie would, would tell us, but the basis lessons are still as they were at the time when we first, we first started this. So um, we should thank them as well, the two that were involved in that. But to look at what's happened to it is incredible. Um, this was a very small beginning. We didn't know what we were letting ourselves in for. I don't know about Harriet, but we, Harriet and I were the non-counselors. We were the non-psychiatrists. And we really weren't sure at all what was going to happen. We were helped by a lot of Swiss chocolate that was sent for our meetings. <laughs> because we'd have these long arguments between Harriet and my angle and Pat and Dick's angle, and we'd finish up eating all this chocolate, remember? <laughs> That's medical treatment. <laughs> yes, and it definitely helped. But the way that it's developed from there is incredible, and I'm very grateful to God that we were able to start it and that it was able to grow in this way. And over to Dick. Well, I want to start out and just uh, give you a brief message from Pat Mirsma. Some of you may have noticed that she's been absent since the uh, morning of the first day. She began feeling ill, and uh, she's doing better, but not well. She's actually, I think, soon to be on the air back to, to Dallas. But uh, she was taken to the ER. She was kept overnight for observation, discharged yesterday, uh, but still not feeling really well. She really regrets not being able to be here. And now we've been busy scrambling because Pat was going to go with us to Ukraine next week to lead the advanced equipping session, help to lead that. And, uh, but uh, um, Tracy uh, Conard has stepped in and he's going to do that. And part of the reason that we wanted Tracy there is Pat and Tracy have been working on a military version of the workshop. Now, one of the things Pat wanted to share with you was the fact that uh, about seven, eight years ago, some military people came to her and said, how do we, can we take this material to uh, chaplains, to the military people? And because there's a lot of issues there, mentioned briefly today was the whole area of moral injury. 
and we'll actually be uh, testing, piloting some of these materials in the Ukraine um, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Pat also said when this started, she was focused largely on a African audience and also American audience. In, uh, she said when she started working in Southeast Asia and other areas that we really can't talk about, she, it was remarkable to her how well it made the transition and that there were sort of universal principles. You needed to make some crafting and changing and adaptation, but still the principles were the same across groups. I ran into a, uh, an African proverb not too long ago, and it's congruent with what a message that we've heard here is uh, it's I am because we are. And uh, we've heard the importance again and again of having community, not only community, but community is safe that we can speak into and hear from. And it's a safe place for us. Um, so when this all started, you know, there's a verse in Jeremiah that says, I know the plans I have for you. Well, we often don't know what those plans are. Now, I ran into a quote uh, not too long ago, if we can get this traveling here, from uh, the Lord of the Rings. And uh, I thought it really captured something that I was experiencing. This is a book that talks about an adventure. It's a story an adventure of people who were not expecting to be involved in something dealing with good and evil and a battle between good and evil. And there's two people here speaking, Frodo speaking to Sam. I wonder what sort of tale we've fallen into, Sam. Yes, that's so, said Sam, and we shouldn't be here at all if we'd known more about it before we started. <laughs> But I suppose it's often that way, the brave things of old tales and songs, Mr. Frodo, adventures as I used to call them. I used to think they were things that wonderful folks of the stories went out and looked for because they wanted them, because they were excited about life. It was a bit dull and, they, and it was a kind of sport for them, as you might say. But that's not the way it is with the tales that really mattered or the ones that stay in the mind. Folks seem to have been just landed in them. Usually their paths were laid out that way, as you put it. Well, the Lord knows our plans. When we first started doing this trauma healing stuff, uh, by the way, Margaret used to call, call me her pet shrink, so. <laughs> but um, when we first started, I just said to myself, there's no way this is going to work. And I was struggling with that for a while, but after a while, I began to realize this is too big for the four of us. It's far beyond that. And I had no idea where it was going to go. So uh, it's just amazing to me. I'm very grateful to the American Bible Society that, that you've picked this up and it's taken it in places and ways that we couldn't have imagined. We have our stories and there's the Lord's story. And the Lord weaves them together in ways that we don't often know what's going to happen. So uh, who thought back in 1999, 2000, that a, a, um, two linguists, translators, one involved with anthropology as well, one in scripture use, a uh, nurse clinician specializing in um, uh, ethnic clinical specialist is what Pat was, and a missionary psychiatrist. There aren't many missionary psychiatrists around, but we were all together at the same place at one time beginning to talk about this. And it's just amazing to me, and I never anticipated that this would happen. And now there's a trauma healing a alliance. And maybe just to update the Lingenfelters, where SIL wasn't really able to embrace it before, they fully embraced it oh, now. No. And, <laughs> and they, um, are part of the alliance. And to me, it's amazing that we now have a group of people really uh, mentored or focused around ABS here, but it's amazing to see it happen. So uh, it's, you know, the Lord has his plans he has for you to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. It's amazing to me how this has moved on. It wasn't us. Thank you.
Oh, yes. That's us in 2002. Uh, we were a little bit younger then, but um, <laughs> that's the first group. The fellow in the straw hat on the upper left, his name is Ishaku. He came from Joss. They had just had killings and burnings of the churches, and the, the, the city of Joss was becoming more polarized with Muslim sections and Christian sections. And he asked the very same question that our man in the film did last night. When are we going to get a vacation? Why doesn't God care about us? Is it the color of our skin? What is it, God? Why do you not care about us? I, uh, remember that, Margaret? Yeah, I, uh, yeah. yeah. I think Kathy was there, too. Kathy Waters. Uh, she's out of the room right now. But uh, anyway. Yes, OK. I only, my only comment, uh, you've seen and heard plenty of me already. But um, I would just like to read to you from Genesis 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham, Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your very great reward. But Abraham had said, Abraham, Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and uh, the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? So how is this going to work? There's nothing here. Um, and, Ab and Abraham said... You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. And then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And he, God took him outside, or the Lord took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him for righteousness. And um, when I looked, when I was preparing the numbers for this meeting, and when I see you and hear the stories, uh, it's like when we were young, um, we went to the desert. My dad used to take us out camping in the desert, and we got to see the stars. Uh, how many stars there are. And so uh, this promise of blessing, and I wish that for each of you who are involved, um, that God would reproduce your efforts beyond what you can possibly imagine. Thank you. So we are to the uh, place of Diane, giving us the concluding remarks. Thank you, Diane. You're welcome. Uh, two things before I do that. One is I think that the, as a psychologist, of course, an observation for you, I think the Lingenfelters have given us a little glimpse into a very lively and interesting marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I would also just like to say that it's been wonderful to be with you all and to hear your stories and struggles and questions and um, just really value what you're doing. And uh, it was an encouragement to me to hear from you. So thank you for that. We close the last section <clears throat> with the verse from Jeremiah 17. A glorious throne on high from the beginning is the place of your sanctuary. The place of greatest power, the place most exalted is the place of our refuge. So I want to close this afternoon by telling you of three brief incidents where I was confronted with these issues that we've talked about in terms of the abuse of power in a cross-cultural setting and a few things that I have learned from those experiences. The first was with the Brazilian pastor that I mentioned to you on Tuesday who came up to me after I spoke and said, not some, but all of the men in my village are alcoholics. All of them beat their wives, and all of them have sex with their daughters. Can you please tell me how to help my people? And I was, of course, initially speechless, which is not usual for me. But it, it felt completely helpless. I mean, how, what do you tell somebody who asks you that? And I, I stood there for a minute thinking in my mind, how does one shine light into such a dark place? And then, of course, I knew. 
the man standing in front of me carried light in him into that dark place. And so I responded to him and said, I know it feels and in fact is overwhelming and feels hopeless, but listen to me. God put you there because you know him and because your life with your wife and your children is something no one in that village has ever witnessed before. They do not know there is another way. Go back to your village and walk with God and honor your wife and love and protect your children. And God will illuminate his ways through you and awaken hunger in others for the way that you live. It will be hard. It is sacrificial. It will be very slow. But there is hope. It is not in you. It is in Christ in you, in that dark place. And by the power of God in your life, you will demonstrate in the flesh the life of a man who does not abuse his power. Drink from him, and your outflowing waters will eventually change the landscape of that town. The second one occurred at a conference for Arab women where we had been doing the trauma healing and I had done some lectures on trauma. Many, probably most of the women in the room were victims of some kind of abuse of power. And at the end of my last session, I opened it up for questions and a woman said this, I was brought up in a Christian home and my father beat my mother and us horribly. Now I am married and I have children. And when we go to visit my parents, if my children do something my father does not like, he beats them horribly. My husband and I do not believe that that is of God. And we do not help treat our children like that. Can you tell me what to do? Now, you need to know that I am extremely cautious when I travel about verbalizing any thoughts I have about someone else's culture. And even when asked direct questions, which sometimes happens, I'm still very careful in my responses. So I asked this woman for a minute, standing in front of the whole group, to just think. Because what I knew was that if I spoke the truth to her, it could result in violence against her and her family. She might be thrown out and disowned by her father. But I also knew that if I said nothing, I would encourage her to be complicit in the evil being done to her children. And she was clearly already convicted by God about that evil. And I myself would be complicit as well. I also knew that I could do the party line. You know, I could say, according to her cultural use of the scriptures, you need to honor your father and let it be. However, I know that it is never honoring to minimize or cover up wrongdoing. So I said to her, I'm going to answer your question, but I want you to know that it is a very difficult answer for you to hear. It is potentially threatening to you. I agreed with her that her father was harming her children and that she and her husband were correct, that his way was not God's way. And so I said to her, you can go home and speak truth to him respectfully, side by side with your husband, doing it together. And what you will be doing is bringing God's light into that dark room. And by his spirit, you will be offering an invitation to your father to step out of the darkness and into the light. To be silent is to teach your children that his behavior is right rather than that it is ungodly and to teach them silence in the face of wrongdoing. You will also watch them carry that wrongdoing down into the next generation 
of your grandchildren if you do nothing. The room was really quiet. And she was silent for a bit. And then she raised her head up and she said to the room, I will do what you have said. I will go home and invite my father into the light. But I will only do it on one condition. And that is that my sisters in this room will commit to pray for me because the women in the room knew the monumental step that she was about to take. And they let her know, of course, that they would pray for her. And I continue to do so. My final example is this. It's a story that I think illustrates for us what a man of much power looks like when he does not clutch glory, but seeks to use that power to bless others. The occurrence carried with it some extraordinary lessons for me, and I want to pass them on to you. Our younger son worked in Abu Dhabi for some time for a member of the royal household, Holt. And we were invited to go to Abu Dhabi as the prince's guest in order to see our son and to visit his country and learn about it. At the very last minute, a phone call came and we were asked by His Highness to change our schedules and come a few days earlier because his schedule had changed and he wanted to be in the country when we were there. When the call came through, knowing it would upset schedules that we had here, our immediate response was to say, of course. The prince had called. We would come. No thought was required. We knew it would affect others, but the response was still certain and sure, and therein lies the first lesson. I, without thought, gave earthly royalty and power immediate obedience. Now, I do not think we made the wrong decision at all, but it was cause for reflection for me to realize how quickly I bowed. How often has my Lord, the King of the universe, called to me and I have equivocated or delayed or sometimes in my life outright refused him. I would do for an earthly prince what I would not do for my king who holds all power. We went. Fancy airline, fancy seats, fancy food. And we were met at the airport by our son to be whisked away immediately to the palace to meet the prince, jet lagged and all. Now, as you know, I am a female. I was about to walk into a room full of Arab men. So, jet lagged or not, I carefully in the car went over protocol with our son. And my instructions were, my husband's as well, of course, wait at the door to be greeted. Do not speak first. The prince will stay seated the whole time. Do not offer your hand. Do not sit until directed, and when directed, sit where you are told. To my son's knowledge, no other female except those on business had been in that room, and he spent almost every evening there, so he knew. So we arrived, and we were escorted into the palace and taken to the meeting place, and the room contained, I don't know, 12 or 15 Arab men in full regalia. My husband and I walked in, and no sooner had we done so than the prince stood. He walked across the room quickly with his right hand extended to me. <laughs> he greeted me by name. He introduced himself to me by his first name, and he gave me the seat at his right hand. Not only that, all 15 men followed his example. They did what their prince did. Needless to say, we were greatly honored and graciously welcomed. 
This man would have been well within his rights to follow protocol. I would have understood and had great respect for those rules. In fact, he risked criticism and lack of respect for breaking all those rules. He chose to gather up his power instead and use it to pour out blessing on us, which in fact he continued to do the whole time we were in his country. He embodied for me power poured out as blessing. So now let's gather up these three stories and learn how our God would have us exercise our power and how he would have us speak when power is abused. I believe God would have us use our power as benediction. I think that's why he's given it to us. We have, got, we have God given power in us to bless the people of this world. And if you've been paying attention, you know I like words. The origin of the word bless is an old English word which means to mark or consecrate or make sacred by blood. God calls us to use our power to bless by way of sacrifice, or as we often say, by way of the cross. Remember, we said earlier on Tuesday that Jesus stood up and said, Behold my hands and my side. As the Father has sent me, I send you. My Brazilian pastor will live sacrificially in that seacoast town. One man, one family full of the light of the love of Christ illuminating a dark world. And that is what Jesus did. The king of kings became one man, finite, living in time and place. He who was omnipresent could not be in Jerusalem and Samaria at the same time. He who was omnipotent primarily healed people one by one by one. He was where he was, in a limited space, full of light and love, ministering one by one and faithful to his father. My lovely Arab woman will live sacrificially because rather than taking the known way, the more comfortable way, she will bring light and love by speaking truth to power, her father, by refusing complicity with an evil done in the name of God. She will bless her father by her speaking with a firm but respectful invitation to the light. She will bless her children, for they will see and know a new way and come to understand that culture, even so-called Christian culture, often fails to follow Christ, and when it does, must not be followed. And how like Jesus, who spoke truth to the religious leaders who would hate the truth and do violence to him, Jesus who confronted those who crushed the little ones. And my gracious shake, who has blessed my son abundantly by welcoming him into his life and his work. And in turn, for love of our son, he blessed my husband and me by stepping across all those divides that protect his name and status, his position and titles and fortifications to invite us to sit at his right hand and be waited on and receive honor from the one we came to honor. And what a small taste, but a true one, of the Lord of heaven and earth seated on the throne who does and will someday welcome us into his throne room with grace and glory. I was awed by the earthly prince who crossed over position Tradition, culture, gender, and training to greet me with his right hand. That experience has taught me, reminded me of, first of all, the awe due to my Lord, who at cost beyond measure welcomes me, crossing over barriers of highest position, but also the barriers of sin and death, to welcome me to the right hand of the Father, he has indeed blessed me 
by his blood. So it is my prayer that you and I, his children, will see clearly about earthly power and not be seduced, not be deceived about any use of power that is not under the authority of the one who holds all power. May you and I live in the dark places, shining the light of Christ on the abuses around us. May we speak to those who are crushing God's little ones in any way or stealing from the people in his churches. And may we, like our Lord, lay aside every bit of our own earthly power to cross divides, step out of high positions, and reach out with love to those whose power has been trampled or who simply have less, bestowing benedictions as we go. A glorious throne on high from the beginning, there is the place of your sanctuary. And Jesus said, all power, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and sacrificially bless my world. Thank you, Diane. Um, I feel like I don't want to put any more words on top of what you just said. <laughs> um, so, but I do want to say thank you uh, to you and to all of the, the speakers um, who are here um, and to all of you who have come from so far um, who are doing this or uh, contemplating doing this in your ministry context. Um, it's an honor to have been here with you, and I just wanted to share my gratitude with each of you. Um, I also want to say thank you to Sarah Dolan. And, and, <laughs> um, and Vanessa and Marlena and the whole team, Christina, Christina, Dana, Kareen, Margie, everybody. But I have seen the team over the past few weeks um, put so much time and effort and prayer and spirit and chocolate into this event. Um, and so I just, um, it's, it's been great to watch. And so I just want to say thank you to you all. I know it was a big, okay. um, and I, I've also seen Harriet, um, with sleepless nights and frenetic days, um, uh, putting, your entire soul, body, and spirit, and mind into this, um, uh, and the way that you do that relationally and collectively um, has been an honor to watch, and this event was great because of it, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, when, I when I first started here at ABS um, six years ago, uh, I saw uh, Bob Briggs uh, who kind of usher this ministry into American Bible Society with uh, strength and wisdom and prophetic voice. And I've seen him, uh, he just played it such a foundational role in, um, in shaping the way that this ministry has grown here at ABS. And so I wanted to also say thank you to Bob for that and ask him to come up and close us in prayer. Thank you, Drew. That's uh, very gracious, and um, and it was uh, a privilege just to play a very small part in sort of hearing God's voice as He was calling, really this this uh, community of practice and its leaders into into being, and and uh, what a remarkable experience to watch this uh, unfold in front of our eyes. When I uh, first went to a part of the world where I saw when I was personally introduced to. Uh, trauma in the way that I, I now have come to understand it. It was a, a dark moment. It was, a, it, was, it was an experience of uh, devastating heartbreak. But I had an experience. Uh, this is on the ground in the eastern part of the Congo. It's funny, Margaret, that you would reference the kind of the early beginnings of the experience of 
of the authors in the Congo. Um, but I had an experience where I, I believed that I had heard something from the Lord. And um, in the midst, of, against the backdrop of that darkness and against the backdrop of that devastation, I was reading in Psalm 68. And I wanted to con conclude our time with a reference to what, uh, what the Lord spoke to me that day, and I've carried it with me to this day and continue to carry this, this promise in my heart. But Psalm 68, as we prepare to pray, says, God rises up. God rises up and scatters his enemies. Later it says, God, who lives in his sacred temple, cares for orphans and protects widows. He gives the lonely a home to live in and leads prisoners out into happy freedom. Now, God doesn't do that by magic. He invites us to be a part of this work, co-laboring with him in this work. So let's pray together uh, as Diane has commissioned us to go forth and, and uh, co-labor uh, with the Lord who, who is the one who gives the, home, the lonely a home to live in and leads prisoners out into happy freedom. Heavenly Father, we thank you for for your promises, we thank you that, uh, that you in particular promise that you will rise up, that you will appear, that you will scatter your enemies, that your enemies will not prevail, that ultimately you will set the captives free. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of co-laboring with you in this great work. We bring before you the individuals and the families and the victims and the perpetrators, those who are connected to this experience of trauma that you've been teaching all of us about. We bring them before you and invite you to rise up in them. Lord, to heal, to protect, to guard, to set free. And Lord, as we watch for the right ways and discern the paths that you've called us to walk on as we co-labor with you, we pray that you'd guard our hearts as well, that you'd protect us, that you'd keep us safe, and that you'd give us all that we need to conduct your work in your way. So Lord, thank you for these days that you've given us to fellowship together, to hear from each other, to learn from each other, to be inspired. Most of all, to hear from you and to hear your instructions. And as we go forward from here, Lord, give us strength, courage, resilience, all that we need to do your work. Again, thank you, Lord, for the privilege of co-laboring with you as you demonstrate through your church your great wisdom and you demonstrate how you will rise up even against the backdrop of great darkness. Thank you, Lord, for the promise. Thank you, Lord, for the vision that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for the invitation to participate. And thank you for these days to be together. So Lord, we love you, we honor you, and may all that we think and say and do bring glory to your wonderful name. And all this we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.